Good morning, everybody. Good morning, good morning, good morning. We're going to get cracking right away here today. I want to give uh, Dr. Baker as much, as, uh, much time as possible here today. So, um, welcome, welcome. Um, I would like to welcome you guys once again to another edition of Church History here at No Hour. Um, next week, we are going to take a break just because it's Thanksgiving, so keep that in mind. We'll just cover some of the, the details right now, so, so don't come next week. I mean, come to church, but don't come to No Hour. We're just not going to be here. So, um, But I, wanna, I have the pleasure of introducing you guys today to Dr. Vincent Baker uh, from Wheaton College, theology professor extraordinaire and uh and he puts up with james too i mean that right there is like high marks right there so um i'll let him tell more about himself um as we go here uh but we have quite a bit in store today so i'm very excited to talk uh, or have have uh, vince talk today and um he's going to kind of keep the same trajectory that tyler was talking yet last week about some of the more philosophical stuff and then how that plays into history and how it's led us to where we're at today. And then, of course, what the heck does that mean? What, now what? What do we do with that? Um, so that's what's really important. Um, let's go ahead and pray, and then we'll, uh, we'll get started, okay? Uh, Father God, we are grateful to be here today. We're grateful to um, be uh, just here in Colorado, beautiful mountains and snow. Um, we, are, we just feel spoiled sometimes, God, by you, by the beauty that surrounds us. Um, God, we... Pray that today you can open our minds, open our hearts uh, to learning from Dr. Bakeout and and what we can do to be better uh, stewards of your kingdom, your creation, the people you put in our path, and everything else that uh, that you give us, God. Um, Help us to truly glorify and share in glory with you, God, uh, in in powerful way, God. We, uh, We love you. We need you. We pray this through your spirit and in your son's name. Amen. Cool. With no further ado, Dr. Vincent Baker. There you go. Uh, I'll get you. Go ahead. You're good. You're good. Start talking. Hi, everybody. Speak. Okay. Hey, I think I think it's working a little bit. All right. So, uh, so I already told you essentially what I'm going to do is it's. It's a version or a part of how we got here. Uh, and so I told Chuck Friday night that I was going to try to cover certain things in 15 to 20 minutes. And then that would give us time to talk because he told me that this is a very conversational group. <laughs> and I think being in a conversational group is utterly magnificent. So. Uh, I'm going to, now notice this word, I'm going to attempt, notice what the word, that word was, attempt, not promise. You see, an attempt has to do with an aspiration. A promise is like a guarantee. I wish I could make a guarantee. I'm not sure I can, but I'll try in 20 minutes to, to talk about some movements and persons that got us to some of where we are today. Okay, so that, that's the goal. So a little bit more about me. Uh, I teach at Wheaton College. Uh, at, in, at, by the end of this semester, I will have been at Wheaton for 23, 23 years. Uh, I, I started in January of 2000, so I'm on calendar years, not school years. That's why I said in, in December. Uh, I married my wife, Shelly, for 27 years. And we have two daughters, age 23 and 20. The 23-year-old works at Tyndale House. My wife also works there. And the 20-year-old is a Wheaton junior. Um, and uh, I'm very thankful for, for having them as a family. And, uh, and I'm in town, uh, in downtown. There's two big conferences that have gone on. There's the Evangelical Theological Society. It was Tuesday to Thursday. Now the American Academy of Religion and Society of Biblical Literature, their joint meetings are happening through Tuesday. But I am flying home this afternoon. So I've been here since Tuesday. And so uh, this is a great way to wrap it up. So uh, we can talk more about me later if you wish. But now let's talk about part of how we got there. So uh, I've thought about different ways of doing this. But I think the easiest way for me to do this is 
I'm going to put one thing on the board at a time, I'm, then I'm going to erase that and put another name or movement up there for that. I thought about, I'd like draw like some like arrows to, it, you know, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to do that. All right, so before I do anything, can you see this? You can see, yes. Dave. Okay, all right, okay. So first, a movement with which you're all familiar and without which we would not be here. That is the Protestant Reformation, about which you have probably heard a lot by now. There's just a couple things I want to say about this that set up where else I'm going. So, one way to think about the Protestant Reformation. You take the Bible, and you put the Bible in the language of the people, because it had only been in Latin. So now it's in the language of the people. So people can read it, but most can hear it. Why? Because most people can't read. Right? I wish we could presume literacy then or now. We can't. Mm -hmm. So they could hear it in their language, if not read it. And, of course, because the printing press, you had more copies, but nothing like mass production now, right? We're, we're in this era where there's like a Bible for every demographic, right? I mean, that's marketing tons of Bibles. <laughs> they didn't have that. Uh, but they did have you know, more than they would have had prior to the printing press. So people had them in their languages uh, in Europe. And the point is, is that so you take the Bible, you put it in the hands of the people or the ears of the people, and so... You then get different Protestant <laughs> traditions that are learning more about what's in the Bible. Because they weren't learning a lot about what was in the Bible prior to that, in, in, from that, that me late medieval era. Uh, and so what happens? Well, you get people like you Lutherans, you get your, your German Reformation, you get things like your Swiss Reformation, eventually you get your Reformation in England, you eventually get some Baptists, and of course the Catholics are also still around. So here's, here's the great thing about that, is that you have people having the Bible in their language, and the, the traditions emerge, but there's a reason why those traditions have different names, because people don't agree on everything. Mm -hmm. And even the Protestants aren't always getting along with each other. So what does that mean? That means, on the one hand, you get a kind of democracy of interpretation, in a way. Now, that's not what the leaders of the Reformation intended. They, they didn't think, we want an interpretation free for all. And who cares what it really means as long as you've got it? That's not what they wanted. They wanted people to really know what the Bible said. But, of course, people had differing ideas about what were the most important things about what the Bible says. So, on the one hand, you have Catholics who were, in general, having problems with Protestants to begin with. And these Protestants were also having problems with them, with, across, with it, against each other, as well as against the Catholics. The point is, is that you do have confusion then about who's got the truth, mm -hmm. right? So you have uncertainty about who's got the truth. And you even get wars, and people killing each other about this. So it's great that the Protestant Reformation gave us this kind of uh, Bible in the language of the people, but it didn't get guarantee that everybody had certainty about what it meant or who was the most trustworthy authority. So, that's all I'm going to say about the Reformation. It was great, but, it, but also there were hazards, we'll call them, that emerged out of that. So, we have the question about who's got the truth. I can be certain about who's got the truth. So, now we erase the word Reformation. <laughs> so that's a movement. <coughs> now we talk about our first person. Our first person, by the way, who was not trying to not be a Christian, but a person who was confused about who's got the truth, or how can I be certain about the truth? His first name was Rene. His last name, Descartes. Can you, say, can you read this? Okay, okay, all right, I'm sorry. Because, again, it's blue and... Can, can you read? Okay, okay. Because I just want to make sure everybody sees it. It's dark enough. Okay, all right. Okay, all right. This is part of it. I've just had times in classes where it's like, hey, Dr. Baker, can you like, make that bigger or darker, please? And because the blue, 
I just feel like it's fading into yeah. Yeah. everything in the back, right? But you said you could read it, so that's good. <laughs> but the important thing for now is that Descartes' name is up there in blue. Green is going to be the rest of the way. But what about Renee? Well, Renee wants to be certain about what to believe because who's got the truth? So he sits by his stove and just thinks about it. Right? And he's trying to think about what can he not doubt. And Rene gets to this place where he goes, well, what's the one thing I can't doubt? The one thing I can't doubt is that I am a thinking thing, is what I cannot doubt. So I'm going to put a phrase up here that he's well known for. I'm going to put, it's in Latin, which maybe some of you are like, oh, I remember that Latin phrase. <laughs> so I'll put it up here. Cogito ergo sum. I think, therefore, I am. Okay, so maybe you've heard that. I think, therefore, I am. What's the big point about this? The big point about this is that what's the one thing that he can be certain about? Is being a thinking person. Or being a mind that thinks, really. And so, this is a big shift in terms of the source of authority. And so with this quest for certainty, it's now not about getting your ultimate source of authority from outside of yourself. Now, does that mean Descartes didn't believe in God, etc.? No, none of that. Why this whole question of who's got the truth, okay, how can you be certain about something? And absolutely not be skeptical about, well, do they have it, or do they have it, or do they have it? What can, if I want to have as little skepticism as possible, he reduced it to being a thinking thing. So what some people call this that happens with Descartes is called the turn to the subject. The turn to the subject, not, not a subject, something out there. The subject as in the person. In other words, the subject. The person becomes the source of authority. The thinking rational person becomes the source of authority rather than something external as the source of authority. So that's a major shift. So if you want to be certain, then now you're, you're thinking, okay, I've got to start with the thinking self rather than something external to the thinking self. All right? So the turn to the subject and Another way of thinking about this is that if you're making the subject the authority, I'm going to put a phrase up here that is important, and, uh, and I've definitely returned to it by the end in a modified version of what it was with Descartes. You have the, okay, let's not fade that, okay. The autonomous subject. Okay, namas is the Greek term for law, right? So autonomous, right? The you know, single, right? Or self-ruling self subject. Okay, no, so what's that mean? So who's ruling? Who's, who's in charge? Who's the source of authority? The self, right? Okay. So that's a huge change because that's... Again, it's not a question of whether God exists, but if you're going to know something for sure and certain, where do you have to turn to the subject, not to something outside yourself? All right? So, that's a major shift that happens with Descartes. Now, another name that's unavoidable. Unavoidable. I wish we could avoid it, but we can't. All right, and this is one person one of the greatest second acts in world history. He did all this stuff in his retirement. His name is, that's correct, Immanuel Kant. And if you want to be like, you know, playing, having your pun, you can say you can't avoid Kant, right? <laughs> because it's true. It's true. Our world would not be what it is without it. Now, Kant, when he's thinking about what we are as autonomous subjects, all right? One of the big things is, is how does our mind work? 
right? If, you, if you're think, this thinking subject, if you're going to know something and know something and be more certain about it, how does our mind hook on to something? So, with Kant, no, there are two words I'm going to put up here, they're kind of long words, but they're important words. When Kant's thinking about how our mind works, and he's thinking about the, what we can sense, this is what you would call the world of sense experience, this world like you know, what you can see, feel, touch, etc. That world is called the phenomenal, wait, that's not called, that's not phenomenal, phenomenal, there we go, the phenomenal realm, down here, okay? And Kant would say our minds hook on to that. Okay, the way our reason works, right? The autonomous subject, right? What can, what, what, what can you hook on to? What can you know? You can know what's down here, right? So, oh, I know this because I can touch it, or I know you because I can see you, something like that. Of course, that's not the only realm that there is, right? There's also another realm Van Kant, and it's in your book too, by the way, the noumenal realm. That's what's up and out there, like where God is. The point being, with your reason, can your reason hook on to transcendent realities? No, Kant would say. But our minds can hook on to phenomenal realities. So, here's what you must understand it. So if you're the autonomous subject, and you're talking about knowing things, and being certain about things, right? then if you're going to prove something, you can really, according to Kant, only prove what's down here. Only be certain about what's down here. Even if God's up here, you can't demonstrate it. Right? Which means, if you're talking about what's really true, what's really reliable, what's really dependable, the thing of which you can be more certain, it's things that are in the phenomenal realm. Now, you know what's going on at the same time that Kant is doing this? You're getting the rise of modern science, which is what, where people with their rationality, these autonomous subjects, are observing what's in the world. And people are categor categorizing things and becoming very enthusiastic about how much they can know with their observation of the world. All right? And, and so, What's up? So what winds up kind of happening here is you begin to move towards the kind of view where what's the arbiter of what's really real? Right, well, so now what's becoming authoritative? Well, the subject, yes, the, 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 certain per, the person, but also this discipline of modern science, which is based on what? Observation of phenomenal. the phenomenal world. Right, so science as the authority in a way, right, because it's what reasoning people, or reasonable people, some, now I'm not <laughs> saying everybody, I'm not saying this, I'm just saying this is a way somebody would say it. So reasonable people would say, okay, if you want to know what's really real, what, how do you get there? You get there by observing what's down here. Because you can't prove this, right? Now, a name that's not on my list, but that is in your book that you should know about, that is also going on at this time, is a man, I'm not going to put this, this, this it's, too, it's too long, a man named Friedrich Schleiermacher. It's in your book. Okay. Friedrich Schleiermacher. Friedrich Schleiermacher is a minister, and he's nervous about people who are getting enthusiastic by this kind of thing, and by modern science, and they are cultured despisers of religion. Do we need religious stuff, stuff out there when we are reasoning, reasonable people? So you, you could also even say there's kind of, among some people, some elites at least, an intoxication about humans being the autonomous subject, right? It's kind of like a liberation of the human being, right? We're li we don't need those stories, those traditions, because we can figure it out. We can observe it, and we can tell you what's really real, you know? So you can think about a phrase like, now we know being something that a lot of these people would say. Right, now we know that if we really want to talk about these things, what human beings are really like, what reality is really like. Trust us as we do our 
observation of what's here, and then we'll tell you what the deal really is. Okay, so that's happening. Kant does, I mean, Schleiermacher does not want to lose Christianity. And so, what does he do? He recasts the way you talk about faith, not as the belief in what happens because of something that's revealed to you from out here in the noumenal realm, something transcendent, right? He makes faith about a feeling that you have on the inside. So it's not about your rationality, but it is still something that's about part of what you are as a human being. Everybody knows that they feel things. And you would say, there's a common reality that everybody has, which is a feeling of absolute dependence. And so that's really the beginning of what's called Protestant liberalism. Because it makes religion about, you know, what is this thing I'm feeling? And then you're kind of reasoning from that, and well, that must be what God is doing, etc. The point being this. Schleiermacher's goal is not to get rid of traditional Christianity, but to try to find a way to make it acceptable to people that are skeptical about the tradition. And so you, it's almost like you're trying to translate it into a way that they will receive. The problem is that you're kind of giving away the farm by doing it. Because you're making it still about what is, is determined by the subject, including how... how Smart subjects who are studying Bible and theology and thinking about getting their tools from only the phenomenal realm, they'll explain things in terms of what's down here and saying you don't need to explain things in terms of what's out there. Okay, so you wind up, you see, a lot of people wind up redefining what, what Christian faith is in terms of what becomes Protestant liberalism. Now, please understand, all along there are people who are holding on to the old, old story while this is going on. But you must understand that this is what is sort of taking over control of everything. That you, you can't escape it, right? So, with Kant, it's really important that you then wind up saying, our reason works by hooking onto this. It can't hook onto what's up here. And so if you want to be certain about what's true, it's got to be determined by what's down here. All right? So autonomous subjects, who are getting their information about reality from what's down here. <coughs> Think about it that way. All right? So I mean, it, it, I'll put it this way. I remember growing up in the 1970s, and, and basically what determines how you're thinking about what's really real? Well, basically what scientists are telling you. You know, basically what, what you know, you're, you're learning from the observable world. Right? And, and, and the way that, it, I mean, if you think about what some people may have felt when we first put somebody in space on the moon, they may have thought, it's only a matter of time before we explain everything through our powers of observation. Right now, it hasn't worked out that way. But, but, there was a lot of things that sort of intoxicating people about that, right? I mean, think about this. This liberation of human beings, you know, as long as they're using their reason. Now, I want you to think about, by the way, the way you were taught about something called the Enlightenment. Chances are the way you were taught about the Enlightenment was once upon a time people believed in superstition and tradition about gods and demons and a world like that. But now we know after the Enlightenment where people were enlightened, coming out of the dark into the light, what happened? They, it's almost like the way it's taught is that a bunch of people in European, a bunch of smart people from England and, and, and Germany and France all came together for a conference, not unlike the one that I just came from. <laughs> and they all sat around and agreed upon the fact that they were autonomous subjects who, who interpreted reality from the, the phenomenal realm, and they agreed that this is what reasonable people should do. Right? Okay, that's not how it went down. Okay? I mean, they were actually, they, they, these people were around, but they were like at different places, and they weren't always hanging out with each other. <laughs> but that's how it gets taught to us. And then, because this happened, now we're in a world of enlightened people where if you're really going to be a reasonable and rational person, you explain things only through what's happening in this world of sense experience. That's kind of the way that it gets taught. And, of course, that result of that will lead to the grand liberation of all of humanity. Of course, as uh, I once asked a colleague about this, I was like, that is, that's not really the way it went down based on what I've read. Uh, in terms of reading, like, because if, if you start reading about how it went down, it's a lot more complicated. And he said the people teach the Enlightenment in terms of what they hope the Enlightenment would accomplish. That what it would accomplish is, is that it would accomplish this liberation of humanity through the use of our reason. Now, by the way, what they also would have said with this view of the Enlightenment is that, and they believed that everybody were rational people. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. 
you ought to read what Immanuel Kant says about people with my pigmentation. Because he did not think that people with my pigmentation were quite so rational. And he probably, in fact, he didn't even think about people with his own pigmentation were quite so rational. It depends upon things like class, intellect, and all those things. Right? But it's cast to us in a way as if, hey, everyone is really rational. Didn't work out that way. Not, not, not in practice, but the story is often told that way. I know I've gone past my, my aspiration. So, all right, so, anyway, Kant you, you, is, is massive for the way that the modern world works. All right, so now, another movement that's really important that happens with all of this, and that's also very important for the way that we think about politics, perhaps, today. This is called, <coughs> Political political liberalism. This does not mean what you might first think it means. Yeah. Because it doesn't mean what we mean when we say conservative and liberal today. What it means is, it means the word liberal is about the word being free. And political liberalism is about the freedom of autonomous subjects. Where again, the sovereign self, the autonomous subject, you're thinking about a political system that enables the freedom of the individual. And what we call conservative and liberal today are versions of ways that people are thinking about how you get there. Right? But it, but it emerges, again, along with what's happening out of the Enlightenment. Because it's still about, what's it all about? the autonomous subject, all right? So, that's, that's very important to understand because all of our arguments politically, at least in the modern West, are about how to have free persons, or at least allegedly to have free persons. Let's put it that way, all right? So, that's important. So, that's a very important movement. Now, three more figures and then <laughs> Let's just talk. Okay, all right. Now, these figures aren't in your book. But, but, they're, but, they're, they're, but they're helpful for thinking about a complication with the autonomous subject. So, the first subject, the first person, is a person who raises questions about our ability to interpret what we read. All right, so I'll give you the last name of this person. I'm definitely not telling you ever to read anything by this person because it's kind of confusing. His name is Jacques Derrida. Okay, anybody heard of the name Jacques Derrida? Well, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, Chuck has heard. Has anybody not named Chuck has heard of Jacques Derrida? <laughs> Oh, there's one. I, I'm tempted. I've heard of him. Oh, okay. All right. Okay. I, I, I wasn't going to. I'm going to go. I'm going to go. Okay. Please t tell us. Jerry Dodd, ladies and gentlemen. No. Um, so, Jerry Dodd basically creates skepticism about the interpretation of texts. Or he's important about this. I mean, he's not the only person, but he's a great, he's a prominent person about the skepticism of, what, of our text. Why? Because of how our minds work. Can our minds really interpret, if I'm reading something that somebody else wrote, can my mind get to what that person intended when they wrote? Right? And he's not so sure. So, you have a certain kind of interpretive deconstruction that would happen with Derrida. So Derrida would talk, talk about, well, it could mean this, or 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 it could mean this. So you really wind up with a kind of experimental approach to interpretation, you might say, with someone like Derrida. The point is, is that when people are reading, okay, when autonomous subjects are reading the same text, it's not sure, certain that they can arrive at the same interpretation. Because can, because can their minds actually get to what the author intended? Or, is it, or, or are they unable to do that because of what our minds are not capable of doing in terms of getting at the reality that is in what someone intended when they wrote something, okay? 
So, that's the first complication. So that's the area down. Another name, okay, this one maybe you haven't heard of. Okay, a man named Richard Rorty. Oh, wait. All right. We've got one. We've got two. I know enough to know it's red flag. Red flag. Okay. You just heard of him, is what you Yes. Okay, all right. I didn't. I've read him. Oh, okay, all right. Okay. I, I, did, I did one of my comps on, on, on him and uh, Cornell West as neo pragmatists. So he is, he is a prominent person in the American tradition of what's called pragmatism. Here's the important thing to understand about this. So Rorty would say look, uh, yes, there was this idea that our minds were just a mirror of reality. They really aren't. And that our, it's just more complicated. And that really, it's not a project that we can actually do successfully when it comes to understanding reality or reflecting reality in terms of what we're saying, doing, etc. So we need to do the best that we can. You know, hence pragmatism. Okay. And so a, a way to think about it then is is that so you have these people or these autonomous subjects. They need to work together around something like saying, what's the best kind of discourse we can arrive at together? about X. Not because we actually can apprehend what's really real about X, but we can actually agree to talk the same way about X. Okay, so again, there's a skepticism about actually how much our reason enables us to talk about reality. All right, so Rorty is a figure. And then, this is the last one. Michel Foucault. All right, Foucault. Yeah. <laughs> you know more than I do. <laughs> Red flag. Okay, so Foucault, the important thing about Foucault, and there's many things you can say about him, is a skepticism about whatever people are doing in terms of how they tell stories or, or do whatever, because the main motivation is about the use of power and the maintenance of power. Right? The point then being that even if people say that's about being rational and just telling you what's there, that really what they're doing is they're telling you what's there so that the world can be ordered in the way that they desire it to be ordered. And to, if you will, discipline those who are, that they want to op function a certain way in society to operate that way. So there's definitely a skepticism about how our minds work. Or even what he might say, even if our minds did work that way, what's prior to any sort of way of being an objective person who's just being reasonable is the fact that there are other motives. The motive for the use of power. Right? So even if people could see the same thing with their rationality, they don't have the same motives. And those who've got the power are the ones who are going to tell the story and people had to fit into that world, right? And then sometimes they just wind up participating in that world and they just assume that it's the way things are. And say, is it really the way things that they are or the way that the people in power want you to think that it's the way, it's the way that it should be, okay? So you've got this question about text, you've got this question about what kind of conversation we can have, and you've got this question about the place of power. All of it, raises this question about whether humans really have this reason that everybody can that everybody has and then everybody can see the same thing and if they see the same thing the reasonable people will just agree on this and then we'll just have a world where reasonable people understand the world and then discern the way to move forward in this world to really some great human liberation and they're saying no actually that's not the case and that you really, what you really need to do is to think about how each person's reason is functioning. In which case, going back to the autonomous subject, it's not, it's not, it's this, it's not whether the autonomous subject 
can see with a, a common human reason, if everybody looks at this stand says, I see a stand there, and they all see the same thing, but the fact that each person is like their own little universe of reason. They're all, literally autonomous subjects who may see the same thing, but they will not call it the same thing. They do not identify it as the same thing. Okay? In other words, so, yes, the thinking self is the center of authority, but each thinking self is a center of authority. Rather than each thinking self being a center of authority because they see, with their reason, the same reality. Or that their reason functions the same way. Or that even if it could, that, the re that, that people would operate with wanting to see things the same way. Because if, if power is a motive, for example, even if they see it the same way, they may want to tell you it's something else because of what their motives are. And if you have to take that in, into consideration, or there's just the fact that, hey, actually, our reason's not as clear as we thought it was, which means people might be looking at the same thing, but because of the different kind of dimness that they have, they still don't describe it the same way. Or just a skepticism about whether we can actually see something really there at all, and if you can't, then what are we all just kind of making up <laughs> as we try to see it together? Right? And so what these people are, are part of, uh, contributing to, is something called postmodernism. In a way of thinking about postmodernism, I once heard a, a theologian named Jurgen Moltmann say it really just seems like it's ultra modernism. And what he meant when he said that was, it's kind of what I've already told you, which is yes, there's the turn to the subject but it's really what we would call radicalizing that. In other words, which means it's making each person the authority. Rather than saying, yes, the subject is the authority, but the subject sees the same thing. No, each subject is themselves, their own little world of authority. Which means what? You have lots of people who are competing authorities, is what it means. And so, here's the thing. How did we get to a world where, you may have thought to yourself at times, how can they believe that? How can they think that? How can they hold that together? It's because it's not about everybody trying to be reasonable in any kind of enlightenment sense. It's because it's really much more like a post-modern way that people are functioning. And sometimes the reason, you know, in our polarized moment, where you have people that seem to think the same thing, what are they doing? Well, they're, what are they doing? They're hanging out together in echo chambers where, where there's an agreement to see the world mostly the same way. But, that, but in a skepticism about anybody outside that echo chamber seeing the world anyway like they do. And so, of course, there's skepticism about whether those people could ever think or see things the right way. And so, and so sometimes that happens with people in their echo chambers. They think, if you're outside my echo chamber, you are deserving of my contempt. You're deserving of my disdain. Because, why? Because you don't see the world the right way. Like we see the world. And so what you must understand is that the moment that we're in now is a world where a lot of people function in a kind of a tribalistic way where what they basically have their kind of set of local truths. Now, I don't want to be very cynical sounding. So let me say this as well, which is that I don't believe it's the case that everyone is trying to be the most radical postmodern person that they can be. Right? But I do think that people are recognizing, one, the promise of the Enlightenment has not been delivered upon. In fact, what I always like to say is like, a lot of the Enlightenment definitely comes out of Germany, to which I always like to say, well, what did that get you? How about two world wars? That does not seem like the liberation of humanity to me. That does not seem to me about a world of sort of dispassionate objectivity where you're just trying to help everybody see what's true and let's see how we can all pull in the same direction and have as great a world as possible for all human beings. So people, so people have a skepticism about that. They're like, well, these people are supposedly objective, but they seem to have other motives. Maybe they have other ideas. Maybe they're thinking about their power. So people see that. 
And then I think sometimes what happens is people have become influenced because of their own desires and interests to kind of want to inhabit the world in the way that they want to inhabit the world. And, and think about this. Think about, think about the rhetoric of the United States. The rhetoric of the United States includes this kind of idea. If you live in these United States, you know what? You can have the life you want, which means it's your boutique world. A world of your imagining, a world of your design, and it's your right to have that world as long as you don't kill anybody. Which means you can do what? You can make up your world. Is what you can do. And it's not about the objectivity. It's about you know, other factors besides just being reasonable. It can be very much about your own imagination. So sometimes when you're thinking in this world where, of social media where people are, have what's called the curate itself, right? Curate, if you curate something, you select what you present, okay? In this world of the curate itself, you sometimes see people who express themselves in very interesting ways. Now, I use the word interesting, I guess you can put italics and scare quotes around it, <laughs> because there are lots of interesting ways that people present themselves. And you might be thinking, why would they do that? Well, in a postmodern world, I mean, how do you know what you are as a person? Or what is a person? What you're supposed to be as a person? And here's one of the biggest things that's happening that I think, especially for people I would say, let's go with 30 and under. Maybe it's 35 and under. We are in a world where people are feeling an obligation, a mandate to pursue their ultimate expressed self. In other words, the goal is to, is to find some way to discern what you really are as a person. And how do you get there? Sometimes you get there by trying to find something about yourself, something natural, the discovered self. Well, a lot of times what else is part of it is very much it's about the constructed self how you build yourself into something. And the problem is, is that, how do you know when you got there? Who, tell, who tells you when you've arrived? And, and now finally, it's like, you've done it! You've done it! You're you! And, and you know what it, it is, interestingly, from a theological point of view? It's an alternative eschatology. Because it's about arriving at what you're supposed to be. In the end. Hey, what's the end of the story? Your expressed self. And now you've arrived. And now you are completely at peace. Because you've gotten there. Right? But that's part of the world that we live in. And it's a world that's enabled by being in this postmodern reality. And it's also a world where there are enough things that happen that people learn about where people are supposedly trustworthy. You, discern, you discover things about the motives of people. People who say that they stand for X, Y, or Z, and then you discover that actually they only stand for what they see in the mirror. That's what they do. They, they only stand for themselves. Now, some people do stand for actual principles. But a lot of people, you discover what do they stand for. They stand for their interests is what they stand for. They're supposedly being objective, but the only thing they're being objective about is, is this, is what they're being objective about. And it's, and it's just, it's, and, and, by, and by the way, if you read the Bible, none of this should surprise you. Because ever since Genesis 3, and ever since humans took the, by the fruit, humans have been of a divided mind. Okay? It hasn't been what it should be. And people have been trying to find ways to, I mean, think, in fact, you can think about this expressed self as a version of taking the fruit. If you eat this fruit, you will have the capacity to take yourself to the stratosphere. You'll be like God. But how are you going to get there? By what you do. Right? So this pursuit of the expressed self, you know, is, is indeed, I think a lot of times, it's not about, oh, God's made me a particular way. He's given me gifts. He's put me in a time and place. What does it mean to discern what that is and live that out faithfully? I mean, that's, that's fine. But, but the alternative version is, I'm in this world. 
There's all kinds of things in this world. I'm supposed to be somebody. There's all these messages telling me that it's my obligation to do you, whatever that is. Mm -hmm. But to do you, you've got to discover you. And here's the other thing. The, the people that are the worst people in the world are the ones that are getting in the way of you finding your true express self. Mm. The, one, the most sacred thing, and it's not just in the United States, actually, the most sacred thing is the pursuit of that postmodern self. It's, it's, it's all around us. It's all around us. Yeah. And it's, for, it's 946. And I said that we would have time to talk. Okay, sure. That's long. I say I said, I said I would attempt. No promise. No I said I. That was an attempt, not a promise. And here we are. So, I'll stop talking and drink this water and wait for someone to raise it. Yes. So I'll drink water after. Well, I'll drink water while you ask your question. I'll inspire you. Uh -oh. <laughs> and we touch on your part of the Reformation and the translation of the Bible mm -hmm. that we go through mm -hmm. and people like Derrida yeah. are introducing skepticism yeah. to what the Bible says. Yeah. I believe this is what you and Chuck call hermeneutics. 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 Yeah. Um, so he looks at different translations of different words. And Owen Barfield says there's a concept of dead metaphors. All of our words mm -hmm. trace back to something. Mm -hmm. We go to the, mm -hmm. the word for wind. There's mm -hmm. a discrepancy. The Hebrew word ruach mm -hmm. is wind, and then our ruach, word ruach, right, sure. spirit yeah. comes from yep. um, the word wind. Right. Well, ruach is also the root word for ruin and rush. A lot of destructive things mm -hmm. in the English language. Yeah. And spirit. It's mainly a positive concept, wind, we, we know that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But when when Derrida takes words like that and says, well, if you really look at what it means, there's a destructive force. Coming. Well, he wouldn't say what it really means. Well, he said what he wants to yeah, yeah, it yeah, means. Yeah, he, yeah. he introduces this skepticism because there could be two competing concepts there. Uh, I wouldn't say he introduces it. It's, it, it's more that it, it's emerging out, out of realities that are already in place. He puts the quite polish on it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what I would say is is that the fact that you get skepticism about interpretation um, or, or deconstruction of interpretation really is what, uh, what uh, Derrida is often known for. Um, in one way, he's telling the truth about the fact that as human beings we have limitations. So we should be surprised if we have limitations. The fact of limitations doesn't necessarily mean then that we can't know anything. So then it goes back in the Reformation when we translate the Bible and a lot of these different concepts have different meanings. Even in church today, we will often use, if you go back to the original Greek or the Latin, mm -hmm. you see that the meaning yeah. is this. Somebody needs to help me interpret that. But this, but this is why we have a tradition of interpretation. I will say this, big picture. Okay, now this may seem controversial, but I'm just going to put, I'm just gonna put, I'm just gonna put it out here. Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox essentially believe the same thing. They believe the same big story. There's a God who's out there who made all of this. He put humans here. He gave them something to do. Gave them one limitation. They blew it. Things really went sideways. He made a people for himself out of which he was going to redeem the whole universe. Eventually through that people, you get Jesus, who's going to be the Savior. And... Jesus lives, he dies, he resurrected, he ascended, he's coming back. Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox all tell that same story. They do not disagree about that. They disagree about details about participation in that story and the fullest experience of that story. Like a word like justification. Is justification about a change in your status? Or is justification about a process that you participate in so that it's basically tied, tied together with sanctification, right? The common thing that both Catholics and Protestants would agree on that is that it is about our right standing before God. But it's how we get to sort of that, that final right standing. And what is the place of what we do in this life in relationship to that, to that right standing? And, 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 and there's definitely debate about that. But big picture, in terms of what the big moves of the story are, that is not a matter of skepticism. 
because, because, because all three will recite the Nicene Creed. The big story is the same. So I think it's very important that we understand that the big story is the same, and also that, you know, when it comes to vocabulary, I mean, we just think about our own vocabulary. We use words with a range of meaning, and depending upon the context in which we, we articulate things, the context helps us determine how that word is used then. Yeah. Right, so there's a range of meaning, a semantic field. So it's not a hopeless enterprise, it, it, but it is an ongoing task, and one of the reasons it's an ongoing task is because we are limited, and because we're not always completely honest in our approach to interpretation. In fact, we don't even always ask the questions we need to ask when we're doing interpretation. Sometimes when we're reading the Bible, the question we need to ask is, is there any possibility that I am an American who lives in a very individual, individualistic culture and how this might be totally leading my interpretation to make me only think it's about what I do as an individual mm -hmm. and not about what it means to be, be a part of a people. Mm -hmm. And then as an individual, among those people, how I go about my life. Because all around us is, you know, thank you, enlightenment, you know, <laughs> this, this very intense individualism. I mean, it's much greater than, than there was in most of world history. And it's not all bad, it's just that it has significant hazards. You know, it wraps up in that part where God would like me to be in his image and be reasonable, but I want to be right. Uh, well, I think that does have a lot to do with it, and you know, and even you know, even some of us on our best days, uh, you know, we have our moments. Let's put it that way. Where, where you go? Well, you know, actually, I kind of like it to be my world, actually, a world of my imagination and construction. Can we just go with that, please? God says, no, thank you. Right. And usually, when we've done that, what happens? Disaster happens. Well, so I was thinking about how, um, well, that whole idea of how we read the Bible, and um, so, side note, I'm an English teacher, and so one of the things that I talk with my students about is the idea of authority one tent, mm -hmm. and also, like, the reader's um, role within that yeah. relationship, yeah. because it's a relationship, yeah. right? Yes, the author has a purpose, um, and yes. we have kind of a place, right, yeah. that we need yeah. them in, and yeah. it's, a, it's a conversation, right? Yeah. So, to me... Even the conversation about reality is like it's a participatory reality. Yeah, yeah. It's not happening to us exclusively. Right. We're not just creating ourselves exclusively. Right. Yeah, yeah. And we interact with ourselves yeah. with other people and so on. And so the idea of like, you know, free will and um, you know, the the uh, what do you call it? Um, the autonomous, uh, autonomous subject, subject. Yeah. It is all subject, really. Yeah, yeah. The relationships we have as well. Yes. That was the thing I was like noticing about all these guys. Like yeah. you're Discounting the influence of the community. I yes. mean, the Bible itself says, "Hey, you're supposed to be in community with each other." Yeah. And you know, we've talked previously about the whole idea of, um, you know, the great cloud of witnesses, right, and that kind of thing. As that's a means by which we are better to understand our reality, our relationships, and our nature with God. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, am I wrong on that? Or no, I, I think. I think. I think. So you know, like think about the dairy dog. You said, "Well, what dairy dog is talking about?" That version, that interaction between say the author and and you know that, that we're participating in, but you get more skepticism from from Jerry Dog about that, rather than the fact that it doesn't mean that we can't get to you know to me. Right? I, I think there's just that sometimes some people have an earned skepticism about that because of the world that they participate in. I mean, there's, I mean, there's a lot of world history that will give you reason to have skepticism about the stories people tell you because of what they include or don't include. I remember when someone said at the end of the Soviet Union, they said they talked about these propaganda histories, and somebody said, we knew these were not men of letters, is what they were saying. In other words, but there was a whole story that was being told. Or think about what, what, what props up North Korea right now? Okay. An invented narrative. <laughs> okay, I mean, there's not, I mean, how does Kim Il Sung become the, the, this leader that like came from God or like is a God? I mean, it, you, I mean, it really seems to strain belief, right? Mm -hmm. But guess what? That's the world you live in. Mm -hmm. But it, it's very much an invented world that seems crazy to us. But it's really not so crazy. If you think about what humans do, a lot of people create worlds that advantage a certain 
in that case, family, <laughs> you know. Uh, and, and, uh, and I think so sometimes I think those kinds of things leave people go, well, I don't know that I can trust any of this. And so I, I'm, and I'm going to try to find some way to make the best of it. Or in some cases, I'm going to find some way to introduce some kind of anarchy into this. I'm not saying that this is not my recommendation. <laughs> yeah, makes me sweet. This is not my recommendation, okay? I did not come I did not come in here this morning with any anarchic <laughs> recommendations. So is that do we get to the modern time where where truth critical theory and truth is about power? Is that, is that how we uh, well, first of all, I think whatever people say about critical theory right now, people need to read a lot more, the first thing I want to say, because it's very complicated. Um, because I think there's, there's a lot of narratives out there where people are throwing around terms, and I don't think they're being honest about their use of those things. Um, but I would say uh, it's, critical theory is one version of ways that people are trying to make sense of the world and the language and the relationships, etc. Um, but and, and so yeah, I mean, some, some, it's part of what emerges in political liberalism in, in, in the Enlightenment, etc. But um, that's how I put this. Uh, if you're in academia. Uh, it's a, it, it makes a lot of sense to think about that if you're in certain disciplines that, that, that this is very prominent in how people are thinking about the way you should function or how you should think about things. The way most people live in their life has nothing to do with it in terms of that particular. No, most people aren't, aren't thinking in terms of critical theory. So, um, because I mean, I mean, to read it and understand it is like really complex stuff. I'm not saying that I'm not saying that it's all anybody's intelligence. It's just like it's just a conversation where people develop vocabulary and concepts and they get in the weeds. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, it's just like whether I'm, I'm not a physicist, I'm not a, you know, I'm not a literary scholar, I'm not a. Like, all these domains have their own little universes of, of, of complicated language and discourse, and sometimes those things trickle down uh, to to what we're experiencing. Um, I, I I don't think that. Uh, I, I would say in terms of the modern world, the bigger problem is what I was saying about the expressive self. About this, because the self is still the center of everything. And it's about the self in pursuit of being after some kind of mythic self, I like to say. And, there, and, and I would say there is a tremendous pressure on younger people, probably specific, maybe under 25, well, not say under 30, where, I mean, it's this brutal thing. Like, you really need to be doing this. And if you're not doing this, then you're like letting other people, you know, stop you from being what you really are. And those people should be criticized for that. I mean, to me, that's, you know, that, that kind of, uh, um, Pursuit in, in, in this pressure chamber for people is, is, is part of it. Second thing I would say is I think the, the, there's the problem of people um, being unwilling to question their own motives if they, if, if they are hanging out in this or that echo chamber. In fact, I would say if you're hanging out in, in, in an echo chamber and your echo chamber leads you to think that people who don't agree with you can't possibly have anything truthful worth saying or believing, then uh, I think you need to remember that what the second greatest commandment is, is to love your neighbor as yourself. Mm -hmm. Which means even those people. <laughs> and, uh, and, it's, and it's entirely possible, by the way, you don't even really know what, anything about those people. Mm -hmm. so, so how can we be certain about what other people believe? I mean, I always like to say, it's like, how many people in your own family do you know that well? Much less people that you've never met. Right? And, and a lot of people are very certain about what they think other people believe. Mm -hmm. And, but, when you get into a situation where, and, and I think some people because of changes in society, et cetera, or potential changes in society, people gather together with people of like mind, and you, and, and, and hey, if we kind of gather together and think about a certain way of doing things, then maybe we'll have a world that we can survive in, right? And, um, and I think that's part of the reason why we have the tribalism, where people, because in those worlds, people create narratives about the way that things are supposed to function. 
And there may be some truth in those things, but a lot of times a lot of falsehood. And that's and that's not a province of the left or the right. That's all over the place. So that sort of answers your question. Uh, it's ten oh two. Uh, I don't know when does the yeah. class end. If you're volunteering today, feel free to hang out and join a little meeting. Uh, by the way, we'll stick around for a little bit. Okay. We'll until about ten ten. Okay. So yeah. I, I didn't know when it ended. Yeah. Okay. All right. So question. So as you talk about the pursuit of self, yeah. Um, and so whether that's the pursuit of self individually for my own pleasure or for my tribe and what we all believe yeah. in the pursuit yeah. of. of of ourselves. How do you talk to your students about that versus what's in this book and yeah. looking at that picture as opposed right. to just the self or my tribe? Well, I think part of what I want people to do is to first think about their identity being an identity that is given to them rather than an identity that they have to arrive at. I do think, you know, we all go about our lives and living out our vocation and there are things that we can discern. Right? And discernment is fine. Um, but Ultimately, the who of what we are is, is given to us. And so when I, when I teach about what it is to be a human being, I talk about that. Um, but also, I, I, I try to help people to understand that, um, you know, it's fine to have your hobbies, to do this, do that, or whatever, but you don't need to feel the pressure or some obligation to be in some mad pursuit of <clears throat> something out there that supposedly when you get there, then you're gonna have a personal shalom. Because it's just, it's, you know, it's, you know, like, like uh, Don, you know, you're tilting at windmills. Okay, I mean, it, it's just not gonna, it, it, you're, you're imagining something and it, it's, it's not real. And, and it's just, um, it's, well, it's, it's a terrible crushing reality. And you're gonna get crushed if you get there. Because you're going to discover that, oh wait, I'm in the book of Ecclesiastes all of a sudden. <laughs> right? It's meaningless and everything is striving after me because you're never going to stop striving. Because I always think to myself, who is going to tell you when you've arrived? I mean, is, which, and these are, which social media tribe is going to tell you now you're there? Right? I mean, who, 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 who is going to say, all right, there you go, ding. Choirs, angels, all kinds of people are here telling you, yes, you made it. It's not there. Well done. It's not there. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly, exactly. But, 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 I, but I think people feel like, they, and, and, it, and it's almost like it's, it's not like, you know, okay, what's command central where there's like this group of people who are sending, who are sending out these, you know, these directions to everybody to tell everybody, this is what you're supposed to tell everybody about what they're supposed to do to pursue themselves, and then they'll be okay. It's, it's, it, it doesn't function that way, which also makes it harder. Because then, because really it's like, okay, well, who, you know, it's like, well, you, 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 can't, you can't really grab it, right? It's like trying to hug a hologram or something. You're like, wait, I thought. <laughs> I think that that's part of the, the challenge. Of it. it's, 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 so, but, but to me, it's, it really is, it's helping people to have a Christian formation that helps them to understand that, look, your hobbies, those things, you can have discernment about those, but you can't get caught up in thinking that you're going to arrive at being okay about who you are, who and what you are, by getting someone. You know, because where's that there? How do you know what it is? And, it, and it's, it, it, I mean, and I think what we're going to see the the negative fruit of that. I think in the next decade or so. Mm -hmm. Raise your hand. Oh, okay. So I was inventing that. Okay. So. Uh, just one thing that I think pictures really well where our culture is comes from a, a holiday classic, Rudolph the Red Nosed. Oh. <laughs> I didn't know which one you were going to go with. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so remember the scene where uh, Hermie, the elf, is not into making toys. He wants to be the dentist. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and finally he just throws out, climbs out the window, and he ends up in the snowbank with Rudolph. And they commiserate a little bit, talking about how they want to be what? Independent. Independent. And what did they decide to do? 
Let's be independent together. <laughs> right, yeah, right. And isn't that yeah. what we see? Yeah, right, right. yeah, it's great. Yeah. 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 yeah, I want to be me yeah. Yeah. myself, yeah. but I gotta get somebody who's going to. Yeah, that's good, that's good, yeah, yeah. So we can get into these groups yeah. so we can be independent. Together, yeah, yeah. I might, I might actually start showing that classes. <laughs> so it's like, do you notice something about what they said? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it's like, how can they be independent? <laughs> together, right? But, but no, I think that's great because it is this set, because people, because people will, here, here, here's to me one example of the thing I think about. Sometimes if somebody, comes out to their family during Pride Month, and there's and, and they and they make a social media post about it, and there are people are saying, "We support you. We're so proud of you." Etc. Oh, I think to myself, okay, how many of those people are people that you actually have interpersonal interaction? With? That's the thing I worry about because I'm like, okay, so is this in, in terms of most of your relationships here? Is anybody helping you to navigate this? Is anybody helping you to discern what, whatever's going on here? But but they, but it's as if that the independent together thing, the, what, what social media often does, is like look, there, but there's all this support I have. It's like yeah, but how much is that support going to like help you to live each day here? You know, and and, I, and, I, and I'm skeptical about about that being possible, and um, and so I, I worry about that when people. Um, when for some people they think that that is sort of arriving in itself, and, and of course, the fact of the matter is is that you know whether it's somebody coming out or whatever it is, um, making some declaration about being a something, um, it cannot bear the weight of you being completely at peace, mm -hmm. because no characteristic of what we are one is a sin is. Is the thing that quote, 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 makes us what we are as human beings, and also on top of that, to the extent that people are estranged from God, they're going to have that dissonance anyway. Uh, and and even when we're rightly related to God, you know, we're discerning what it means to understand being fully who God has made us to be. We're, we're growing, we're continually growing into that, and to and to having greater shalom. And but if people are thinking that it that they get it from something else, it's you know, it's, it's just an example of the fact that the creation is great, but the creation cannot give you what God can give you. And th there's always that temptation that something in the creation will give us the ultimate reality. Right? So people change, they change the creator for the creature. Right? And, and that's, um, it, people will wind up on a kind of merry-go-round of frustration. I mean, they, I mean, they might have some intoxication for a while. Like, it's, it's great, but it's going to wear off. Yeah. Well, I was going to say, you know, what I, I find interesting of all the very technical criticism mm -hmm. that Durham is part of is how philosophical they need the system to have this. Because he went and wrote a book. Oh, yeah, yeah, right, yeah, right, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. truly yeah. believe that no one yeah. can actually apprehend yeah. that you're not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so, so there's that kind of distance there. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what is really true? Yeah. We actually can. Begin. I, I mean, philosophy science, but you know, you get the same progress oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. of science. Oh, we can't understand what a electron means because <laughs> someone, right. someone right. has to use that right. We don't know what they did. Right. right. Yeah. No, I, don't, I don't think that's actually true. Yeah, yeah. No, no, I think that's that's part of the conundrum, right? Is uh, And I think, you know, um, I think Jerry Dow is aware of that, um, uh, but, but I think it's you know trying to, and people are, are are trying to find some way to be less lost in a way in the modern world, because when you have the disenchantment with the promises that the modern world offers, and you have reasons to be skeptical about about, because if you think about it, the modern world offers humans liberation by being these reasonable people who believe themselves in the promise. And it hasn't. And now what? And so people are searching, trying to figure it out. Yeah. He has his hand. Can he ask that question? <laughs> so, okay. Um, I'm going to try to 
kind of tied together with just a couple of scriptures. Okay. Romans 12, you know, three categories, you know, they have basically three cat categories summarized in 12, Romans 12. And it's a conduct in relationship to God, conduct in relationship to the church, and conduct in relationship to man, which kind of encapsulates in sort of a summary form of what you're talking about. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Sure, you do sure. Groups yeah. And how you're supposed to interact with those groups. Yeah, yeah. And so forth. How would I also engagement with the world itself? Yeah. Engagement with the world. But then you also have another section that really causes a lot of problems to find you know, <laughs> issues that ponder us a lot is in uh, Second Corinthians uh, seven, where you have a set of verses, you know, from eight through um, eight through twelve, and basically what they talk about is that Paul is going to talk to the Corinthians about their repentance and how they handle some of their sins and the disgraces and yeah, so forth. Yeah. And it says, for you, for you were made sorry in godly manner that you might suffer for loss and nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. Mm-hmm. Not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Mm-hmm. And it's that sorrow of the world produces death. And there's a real big tension between how are you, how a person approaches that? Mm-hmm. You approach it from the world side or not? Can you mm-hmm. comment on that? Uh, well, I think particularly in that situation, he's responding to the Corinthians who had many, you know, they were a reality TV show waiting to happen. Um, uh, and they overcompensated in their, in their discipline, uh, in their community. And so he, he's trying to help them to discern, to understand that the goal is not to make somebody just feel bad for the sake of feeling bad or feeling like you're nothing, but, um, but you know, a, a sorrow that's really reorienting you towards our you know, whole life. The goal isn't to just for people to feel bad. Um, so so I, I think um, it's important that we understand the, I think the particular thing that, that Paul was getting at there. But, but I do think there is something to the fact that there are ways that people participate in the world um, whether, however they're managing the various relationships in the world where uh, if things go wrong People do wind up having. It's the only sorrow that they can have is, is a worldly sorrow, uh, which is which is not going to leave them with any kind of path towards you know, life with God and, and and really I'd say life towards becoming a more whole person. So anyway, that that's generally the direction that I would take with that. Um, I do think that we're. Uh, uh, within the church, I think maybe we, we, we need to help people to understand how to navigate those things because church church doesn't always do so well with helping people to navigate you know godly sorrow. We either you know excommunicate or you know, shoot our wounded uh, or sometimes pass over stuff rather than walk with people through processes of, processes of restoration. Okay, so let's give it up for Dr. Micah. Thank you for coming here today. Um, I want to give you guys a quick little quote from good old F. Scott Fitzgerald. He says, the test of a first-rate intelligence, or I might say a spiritual person, is the ability to hold two opposing ideas in the mind at the same time and still retain the ability to function. So I would say... You know, t- take uh, take uh, a piece of advice that Dr. Baker gave, uh, gave some of us on Friday night, which is grab a book of somebody you totally disagree with and read it. And maybe that'll help you understand the world and humanize the people that are around you so that we can engage the world a little bit better and bring the light of Christ to, to all people. So uh, with that, let's go ahead and pray here, and then we'll head on down to, to service here today. Uh, God, thanks so much for today. Thanks for uh, Dr. Baker uh, giving us this great um, just lesson and uh, thoughts about how to how to think about the world and why things are, are the way they are, rather than just shaking our fist at it, but instead learning about it so we can engage in it, so we can be that light and truly uh, bring bring more people into the fold of your family. God, uh, God, help us today to. Uh, Enjoy our, our corporate rather than individual worship uh, together here um, downstairs in just a few minutes. God, we love you. Uh, we need you. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. Cool. Thanks, buddy. Appreciate it. Yeah, that was fun. That was good.